I've been working in many countries. I've done a lot of work in Latin America, uh, in banana production, in fruits and vegetables, as well as in Asia Pacific and Europe and the Americas in Northern America. And so um, I'm happy today to have been asked to talk a little bit about what do we think is happening in the future um, with microbial biocontrol. And I had a recent um, opportunity to hear some interesting um, insights into that, which I am looking forward to sharing with this group. So I was asked to talk um, about research trends and what we're seeing happening in the world of microbial biocontrol. And then also to comment on what is Bayer doing in this, in this area and what is the, the future look like there as well. So I will not be talking a lot about Bayer specific products, rather, what does the industry see coming? What do we see in terms of new things that are happening um, in, in this area? A few years ago, I gave a presentation uh, at the Ag Chem Summit, um, which started with this slide, which was a survey of growers asking what is slowing the adoption uptake of the use of biocontrol agents. And in that presentation, I talked a lot about this third point about our need to get across information about how products are working. Like I mentioned, this knowledge, the sort of day-to-day -day job I have, what are the trial results, and how that can help improve with this first point of lack of efficacy. But what today I'd like to do with the same slide is to think about what is driving our need for innovation in microbial biocontrol. And I think it's really being um, addressing these first two points. Our experience in microbial biocontrol is that these products are often, when tested alone, standalone, not reaching the efficacy level of synthetic systemic chemistry. And this is not surprising because the mode of action is very different. These are usually contact products they're not inside the plant systemically and having a long lasting effect. Um, and understanding how to work with them is very important. Another aspect, the second uh, reason that growers gave was that they were expensive. And the reason I wanted to start with this slide is because what I saw in terms of the innovation coming uh, in bio, microbial biocontrol is trying to address these first two points. Can we increase the efficacy of microbial products? Can we reduce the cost to help make it easier for entry into the marketplace for these microbial products? And so I'm going to address from these two points of view. And just wanted to point out also while we're on this slide that there are some group of farmers that no matter what barrier there is, they're going to use biological products. And in a more recent uh, survey that we did carried out, um, Bayer carried out with hundreds of growers in both Latin America and North America and Europe, we found a much higher adoption and uh, a very high number of growers are already incorporating microbial biocontrol agents into their programs. And most of these are conventional growers. So we are seeing the market grow. And we have more and more interest for a number of reasons that also include the fact that uh, new products are difficult to register. Synthetic chemistry products are getting more difficult to register in many places around the world. And there are fewer tools available. So we know biocontrol is going to be there for us for the future. And we need to understand how we can best improve in this area. So that's really the background for why I'm going to talk about these different areas 
of things that I'm hearing about um, in the microbial biocontrol world in terms of the future. So I wanted to uh, mention that recently I was very fortunate to be able to attend a Congress, which is a fairly new Congress called BioAg World, which was put together um, in order to bring small companies in this space of biologicals, biostimulants, and biocontrol together with larger companies that are commercializing products um, in order to exchange information. This conference was held in Valencia, Spain, um, and it was the first in-person conference I've been to since COVID started, um, and it was a fantastic opportunity, and it's where I heard about a number of new things that are coming to market, or at least are being researched. And so I wanted to uh, point out that. And so some of the things that I will be covering today will include topics that we were hearing about in terms of peptides, in terms of enzymes, uh, biochemical microbial products, um, RNA interference, and I will not talk about phages, as I saw that was a topic already being addressed by another author today. So um, just to mention also uh, briefly, before I begin talking on peptides and enzymes, that this new Congress, uh, the BioAg World, which I'm not associated with, but I found it very useful, um, next year will actually be in Latin America. So they had their Congress, uh, as I mentioned recently in Spain, um, and the next one will be in Rio. So it was a very interesting way to hear a lot about what's happening in the biocontrol and biostimulant um, area with small companies coming up. So what I'd like to start with today is to talk a bit about peptides and enzymes and things that I'm hearing about. And here you can see a couple of examples where here's my drawing of small number of amino acids strung together for a, a peptide or a larger um, enzyme here. Uh, and so let's talk a little bit about what I'm hearing about peptides and enzymes. One interesting aspect is that there has been a lot of discussion recently about these kinds of biomolecules, peptides and enzymes produced by microorganisms with a very different mode of action. This mode of action that I've been hearing about and we've been working with ourselves as well is looking at how can we turn on the plant defense system so using molecules, whether they be peptides, enzymes, or even uh, small molecule biochemicals, um, these kinds of compounds can be sprayed or drenched to plants. And this can turn on the induced resistance of the plants. This is not a new concept, but this is the first time I've been seeing products um, from a number of different companies with uh, approaches like peptides and enzymes that are uh, giving some very high efficacy um, in terms of activity against diseases and plant diseases. Some of the effects of these plant defense inducers can um, have, have a wide ranging effect. I mentioned before that many biocontrol agents are contact products. They need to contact the disease or the pest. In this case, when you turn on the plant defense system, that defense system is activated throughout the entire plant. So the signaling peptide or enzyme or compound signals the plant to turn on its own system that is then transmitted all the way through the plant. And this can give some long acting activity, uh, long acting activity in the plant. It can provide a rather broad spectrum activity. Um, and uh, we can also see some specific things happening in the plant, such as increased uh, strength of cell walls and cuticles, um, different kinds of compounds the plant can produce, phytoalexins to ward off diseases, different kinds of proteins that are produced by the plant. 
And in some of the examples I saw recently, um, for example, there was a company that was working uh, called Elemental Enzymes that was talking about their um, peptides that they're using specifically in citrus greening, which I'm sure anybody from Brazil on this call is very familiar with, a project that we are actively working on um, in bear crop science as well. Um, to try to find a way to treat this disease, devastating disease that is in the plant vascular system. This company um, uh, talked about their peptide, which they were using as an application, one application in a season, which was uh, um, greatly increasing the fruit production of the HLB infected trees in Florida, where all trees are infected. And they were seeing increased uh, bricks, increased fruit production and healthier trees from a single application in a year of this peptide. And they had a lot of field data on other diseases as well, including citrus canker uh, and also um, post fruit bloom drop, a fungal disease. And in those trials, they were showing efficacy as good as the chemical products. So these kinds of peptides and enzymes are um, offering some, appearing to offer some high efficacy in, with this different mode of action. Um, that could be something very interesting for the future. And I think there are some um, and these are also some potential cost-effective products as well. One of the other advantages of these peptides is that um, they can be produced by microbes and they also can easily break down into amino acids in the environment. And uh, another example of uh, these peptides and enzymes that are we're seeing in the marketplace are being discussed by a company called Vesteron for one, uh, where they are taking spider venom, which is an enzyme um, and or uh, protein and using that in order to kill insects. And so this is giving some high level of efficacy for uh, treatment of um, different kinds of insect, insects. For example, they have a product um, that they have registered with EPA now called Spear T, uh, which is active on uh, soft bodied insects such as aphids, thrips, white flies. And they also have um, another product uh, based on this kind of uh, specific protein chemistry, which is active on caterpillars. Um, and that is their spear lep product. Uh, these mixtures in nature are very complex, but it's possible for them to look for specific um, enzymes, which have activity on the insect pest, but not are, are not active in mammals. And so avoiding this toxicology problem and having a product that is a very specific uh, to the target pest. And these kinds of proteins and peptides that I've been discussing can also be um, produced by microorganisms and they can be registered as biological products. So these are some ways that we can have some different kinds of active ingredients that are microbial that can have an improved efficacy for the target organisms. One of the challenges with peptides and enzymes is that they are broken down easily. That's good for registration and environment, but it's also a challenge for growers who are trying to maintain these products uh, on, the, on the plants or in the field in a way that they can uh, be lasting long enough for the activity. So I want to talk a little bit about some ways that these peptides and enzymes can be stabilized. And this is actually um, something that was uh, developed by microorganisms themselves. I'm using this um, tennis ball here 
as an illustration because there are certain bacillus species, including uh, bacillus subtilis, including bacillus thuringiensis, that have devised a sort of coat around the outside of the spore. So if you think about the tennis ball, it has a kind of fuzzy nap on the outside. And it's this fuzzy nap that these bacillus spores have devised as a way to carry enzymes and proteins. And the purpose of this is stabilization. So they have this uh, called a spore display on the outside of the spore where they can stick enzymes, peptides, proteins onto the spore, stabilizing those enzymes so they don't break down in this way. And there's a very nice review of this spore display technology that was um, recently in the literature. And uh, what you can see here is this bacillus spore with these attached peptides. So it's produced the peptides and attached them to the outside of the spore. And this will stabilize them in the environment so they don't break down uh, until they hit their active uh, target. So it's a very interesting technology. And what's more interesting is if we think about how we can try to change what is on that spore, what is displayed on that spore. So if we think about it, uh, one of the things we know is that organisms readily exchange genetic information. This is why plant breeders can easily cross different plants in the same species and get different kinds of traits. And it even happens between completely different kingdoms in biology. So my example here is the sweet potato. And if you're familiar with this, sweet potato naturally has DNA from agrobacterium. And that happened over time in nature because agrobacterium likes to swap information. So when you eat a sweet potato, you are eating this DNA that also contains agrobacterium DNA absolutely naturally. Organisms swap genetic information. And so that is something we can use in microbial biocontrol product development because in many countries, if you are using the same species, for example, Bacillus subtilis strains, two different strains, they naturally swap genetic information. And you can take these two Bacillus species that I've shown here on the left in my little test tube I've drawn. One species of Bacillus is capable of producing this particular peptide. Another species of Bacillus has this ability to display proteins and peptides on its spore. If you put them together, they will start exchanging information and eventually this spore display bacillus can produce the peptide from the other same species and put it on the outside of its spore coat. So we can now think about specific peptides or enzymes that we want to get to plants that we want to deliver to systems that we can control diseases or pests by stabilizing these enzymes. So we have a technique for using a very um, environmentally safe type of approach with peptides or enzymes or proteins that we can attach to a bacillus spore coat to carry it to the target and in many cases, the registration of these types of products are considered non-GM because they can naturally and do naturally swap genetic information. So with this approach with peptides or enzymes, we can see that we've been able to, with these companies, greatly increase the level of efficacy and also have a way to stabilize them and address the, the um, instability of these kinds of approaches. In the next section, um, I will talk a few minutes about a biochemical approach 
also a regulatory pathway uh, by which we can still have a microbial biocontrol product, but trying to increase the efficacy, um, thinking about the uh, increased active components that microbes are producing. And we will therefore be talking a bit about increasing efficacy and reducing cost. Patricio um, uh, referred to my background in terms of um, developing biocontrol products. My original um, project in the laboratory with AgriQuest as a chemist was to understand all of the compounds produced by the strain 713 that's in the serenade biofungicide, microbial biofungicide. And I've worked with this product for many decades now. Um, and one thing we know a lot about is how we can produce this. So using a fermentation process to grow this strain, we will take the spores into the fermenter, provide the right ingredients, and then the vegetative growth will be when we produce biological compounds. And these biological compounds are often very important in the efficacy against diseases, uh, fungal or bacterial diseases, or to promote plant growth. And when those compounds, when we have the vegetative growth um, completely run out of, of the ingredients, then all of the cells turn into spores. And what ends up in this microbial biocontrol product is both the biological compounds and the spores. And it can be bulky, there's water involved, or maybe it's a powder, but it has a lot of fermentation material in it as well, which means it's not as highly purified as it could be, but it's a microbial fermentation product. So that's a traditional approach. But if we're thinking about future and what companies are going towards in some cases, let's talk a little bit about what a biochemical product might look like. So here uh, we're thinking about looking at our jug of microbial product where we have a mixture of spores, we have different biological chemistries, um, and this is the product on the left. Um, and you can see that you've also, you will also have spent media from the fermentation. And so one of the ways that we can approach this is that we can either get rid of the spores by purification, or we can kill the, the cells. There are some companies that are providing um, cell-free extracts. And in this case, they're able to greatly concentrate the number of biological compounds that are present in a formulation. And in this mechanism, it's possible in this case to increase the level of efficacy by increasing the amount of biological chemistry that is present in that product. Now, this can have different kinds of effects on registration. Different countries see this in different ways, um, but there are cell-free microbial products that have been registered um, that are uh, able to increase their level of efficacy. And in this case, also, we need to think about costs and how well will we be able to produce products that have a cost that's effective for growers. But biochemical um, products, biological products are being investigated and being registered by companies. And this is another way to try to address this efficacy question to improve the efficacy of biological microbial control agents. So the next section uh, that I'd like to talk a little bit about will be another technology, uh, which is a microbial produced technology, which is RNA interference. And here on my little slide, you can see some mRNA. Um, and this is a technology that uh, was discovered that it was already happening um, in biological systems and that scientists are trying to 
take advantage of in order to make a new generation of microbially produced biocontrol products. So let's talk about what RNAi technology is. The I stands for interference. And really this, as I mentioned, was a naturally occurring process in that um, most organisms have single-stranded messenger RNA, and that messenger RNA works to translate the DNA uh, from organisms into proteins, proteins that are critical for many life functions. And so these single-stranded RNAs are going around and making proteins out of the double-stranded DNA in organisms. However, viruses have double-stranded messenger RNA. And uh, when they infect organisms, because of our own defense systems that have developed, um, whether that's in insects or, or bacteria or, or mammals, we've devised mechanisms to recognize these double-stranded mRNA molecules as something foreign and something to destroy. So our own systems have devised these little systems, for example, in this picture uh, on the bottom right with the dicer, when they find double-stranded mRNA, they have a mechanism for taking it out and destroying it and, and tearing it into small pieces. So biological systems are already set up in a way that they can destroy double-stranded mRNA. So the technique here is to identify a sequence in a pest. This is working well in insects so far. So in the case of Colorado potato beetle, uh, a company uh, called Greenlight has worked on finding a protein that is in that potato beetle that is critical to its survival. And then they make double-stranded mRNA sequence matching that uh, sequence in the potato beetle so that its own system attacks its own proteins. So it's very, very specific and it can be made in microorganisms. They can produce this double-stranded RNA that is identical to the single that is normally in, in the insect. And this has been used in uh, different kinds of insect species as well. And so it's a very um, highly technical way of having the insect attack itself and not recognizing its own um, machinery and breaking its own machinery down using this RNA interference technology. And this is not um, passed to the next generation. So it is like a treatment that can be put on a plant um, and ingested by the insect to break its own system down. Apparently, these are very inexpensive to produce, so the products should not be very expensive. However, there is the issue that um, stabilization is important because these uh, uh, mRNA and, um, strands are delicate, and so they need to be stabilized in some kind of formulation in order to make sure they can get to the insect um, and be ingested. And as I mentioned, you know, some of these um, aspects uh, are being addressed by being able to produce cheaper products. Um, they are easily broken down in the environment. Um, and companies like Greenlight and RNA Renaissance, it's called, have developed a product for caterpillars as well. We know that um, caterpillar species are really challenging now to find enough chemistry or biological products to have efficacy to control them. So we need to find more products that are active on lepidopteran pests. And this is one um, new technology that could be applied to address some of these different insect uh, targets. So very target specific and can be uh, produced rather inexpensively. 
So these are many different technologies that we've been hearing about and that companies are working to commercialize and working with partners to commercialize. So the other question that I was asked is, what, what is Bayer Crop Science doing in this area? As Patricio mentioned, um, I uh, joined Bayer Crop Science uh, when they acquired uh, AgriQuest. Uh, that was in 2012. So now 10 years almost um, working within Bayer Crop Science alongside um, the, the development of all kinds of crop protection products, but specifically myself working in the microbial and, and the biological space. So what is Bayer Crop Science doing uh, in the future here? We've had um, a shift recently and our understanding in the industry is that biological products are going to continue to play an important role and their role will increase in crop protection. And this is certainly influenced by the number of things happening around the world, including where our headquarters are in Europe with uh, the EU Green Deal, uh, with the many initiatives that it are working hard to reduce the traditional synthetic crop protection uh, applications and change our practices um, to include more of these kinds of biological products. We recognize this as an important trend. And one of the things we want to do is to be able to offer as many tools as possible to the growers. And as a result of that, we have really started um, a new approach to this where we are forming partnerships with a number of different companies to be able to add new products and more products to our portfolio. And uh, some of the technologies I talked about are things we're very interested in, um, in terms of, for example, peptide and, and um, protein chemistry. Other things I didn't mention today because they aren't microbial uh, would be things like plant extracts, which we also find very interesting. And even uh, working to the future on things that may be very futuristic, like synthetic biology. What can we get microbes to do to address very big challenges in agriculture? And these might be not only controlling pests and diseases, but trying to address things like climate change and carbon sequestration in agriculture. So what we are doing is transforming our business for biologicals to broaden our portfolio in order to really offer more products to growers based on science. Um, the result of that is that uh, we are really moving to a model where we will not be doing internal discovery. So we will be concentrating on uh, looking to, with strategic partners uh, to have our focus be on best-in-class product development and commercialization. So we will be doing all of the work with our partners, but we will be handling the piece where we are formulating, field testing, commercializing in order to have access to more products that we can make available to growers. And this, what we call an open innovation model, means we'll be working with a number of different companies in a number of different places in order to add more products to our portfolio uh, and uh, have a, a model that allows us to access all of these new technologies that I talked about today and have an open mind about where we'll go with products that can be registered as biological control products or biostimulants for helping the growers deal with the challenges they have and managing with sustainable practices. So I hope that that has given uh, an overview um, of what our intentions are, but also what we're seeing happening in the industry um, with biological control and specifically here about microbials. And